I'm so delighted that you're joining us for Accelerate today and our guest is very, very special. We've had several meetings before. She has fascinated me each time. I've learned a ton each time. Her name is Elizabeth Onyabor. Let me tell you a little bit about her first. She is a leading international expert on perfectionist leaders and high achievers. As the founder of Inner Genuity, Liz coaches leaders ready to put perfectionism in its place to achieve greater impact and profitability. Liz has guided both individual and organizational transformations around the world for more than 25 years and has been featured on ABC, CBS, in the Boston Herald, the Wall Street Week, Fox, and NBC. And she's also an award-winning, best-selling author and poet. Liz, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. It's my pleasure to be with you today, Matt. I'm really excited about our conversation. And I wanted to dive in because perfectionism is not something that a lot of people, I think, talk about in terms of leadership, but they're thinking about it and they're impacted by it. And so to give more of an explicit, direct approach to, hey, let's talk about this thing, I think is really valuable. And I'd love to learn more with you and hopefully help other people. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, uh, there tends to be more perfectionism with leaders because we're um, so driven in many cases to hit uh, a very high standard and um, and certain occupations actually have more um, people who consider themselves perfectionists and are troubled by perfectionism and that tends to be like doctors, lawyers, architects. Shocking. But <laughs> yeah, but they say that one in three um, may have perfectionism, but there's three different types of perfectionism. And um, the first is self-imposed, and that's the perfect the expectations we have of ourselves. Mm. And the second is um, other-oriented perfectionism, the expectations we place on others. And then the third type is socially oriented perfectionism, and that's what we think others expect of us. And we can have one or all three or just two of these um, three types of perfectionism. Mm. So on that uh, theme of the different types of perfectionism, and we touched on a little bit offline before, can you help our audience distinguish between the perfectionist and perfectionism just to go further on this definitions? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, as a perfectionist, that's part of our identity. So we say, you know, typically we're like proud, like we have high standards, we're driven, you know, like we, we're the get it done person. We raise our hand when there's something to be done. Like, um, so, so we have, we basically have this perfectionist identity and it's like a badge of honor, you know, we're proud of it. Well, the perfectionism can be crippling and the perfectionism is what um, happens when we beat ourselves up when we don't meet that high expectation that we have and our inner critic goes wild and we basically carry around an inner brand of shame um which is the perfectionism and it can be really crippling and we tend to think it's just me but honestly it's all self orient it's all self-oriented perfectionists who have mm who can have this crippling perfectionism. So if I'm, I mean, there's a lot there that you just covered. As far as the definitions go, I can think of the, the ist is the identity and the ism is the condition. And so right. if I can separate out those two, it's, it's harder to deal with the identity than it is. If you focus on the ism, which is something you can actually work on, um, it's yeah, because it's a better nobody says, of- I don't want to be a perfectionist anymore. Right. They just want to get rid of the ism part of it, the the issues, you know, the procrastination, the yeah. the critical self-judgment. Um, essentially, we have a lot of difficulty 
uh, starting things or finishing things. And um, it creates a lack of agility as well. Mm. So before we go into some of what the the negative impacts, you know, what are some of the signs? I definitely want to get into that shortly, but I'd like to go back in time just for a couple of minutes here and get a little backstory from you. Uh, Cause you have quite a history and quite a career. You've done a lot in, you know, human resources and, and poetry and all these other fascinating things. Um, how did you come to this focus on perfectionism? You know, it's funny because, um, at some level, I had awareness as I was doing self-discovery and writing some of my books that uh, perfectionism was affecting me. Um, I had a lot of mom guilt. I had a lot of leader guilt. I didn't think mm. I was um, doing enough for my team. I wasn't the kind of leader that they should um, have. I wasn't, I mean, I was really, really hard on myself. And, um, and I guess what happened was I created a program and I realized that the people I was attracting the most were perfectionists. <laughs> and um, also I would say in my journey, what, what happened with me is that I had this really deep uh, inner loathing because I really thought that I wasn't good enough. And so that affected everything from, you know, both professionally and personally. And uh, I felt like I had what I would call a black hole um, in my soul because I would, I would do achievement after achievement after achievement. And it'd just be like sucked in, sucked in, mm. you know, like no achievement ever really lasted. Mm. And so I almost felt like a, a hamster on a wheel, you know, chasing achievement after achievement after achievement, like maybe I'll then feel good enough. But see, this is the hallmark of perfectionism mm -hmm. is that we don't feel good enough and we think it's just us, but it is perfectionism at play. And that's why I say, let's put it in its place because we can feel good enough. And it's not that we don't love ourselves, but expanding and integrating and loving our whole self. And that's what I, you know, they talk about the uh, dark night of the soul and that kind of thing. And I, I like to say, I, I walked through the valley of my shadow and wished for death. Uh, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> that's yeah. a, I haven't heard that one before. That's really that's, good. That's part of one of my poems. So that's a Liz on you are originally original. <laughs> yeah. So that's a line from one of my poems. <laughs> Uh, because it got to such a point that I just wanted the pain to go away. But yeah. so much of that was fueled by the perfectionism, not believing that, you know, I wasn't meeting these standards up here. So um, when I discovered that actually so many of the clients or, you know, the vast majority of the clients that I was attracting were perfectionists, I was like, okay, yeah. I mean, I understood this route for me and I thought, well, I'm going to work with perfectionists uh, because the perfectionism is really what's uh, holding us back. Sure. Yeah. What What are What are some of the other signs you, you describe your own personal experience that brought you to this focus as you work with clients and reflecting on your past, whether you were working on it, you know, knowingly or not, what are some of the sign, other additional signs that you see that yeah, so, say, hey, so we may have the, a perfectionism problem here? <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that I work with clients first mm -hmm. is about awareness. And so mm -hmm. the definition of a perfectionist or perfectionism is that you set a high standard and then you don't think you meet it. And then we have this not good enough gap. And then the second component of this, which is really important, is that we may set a high standard and actually meet it. And then we say, well, wait a minute, that was too easy. I should have done a higher goal, right? And then we subconsciously create this not good enough gap. Mm. So it's this constant state 
of not feeling good enough, having a very critical um, inner voice. And, uh, and so it's this, this cycle of setting a high standard, either not thinking we meet it or we meet it. And then we are like, ah, I should have done more, should have, could have, would have. Um, that is the very definition of the self-oriented perfectionism. And mm. it affects all sorts of things like we tend to have weaker boundaries. We tend to say yes to people. We tend to get overwhelmed. We tend to get uh, analysis paralysis so we don't start things or we, um, we get overwhelmed and then we're like, oh, but it's not going to be perfect. We, you know, they talk about FOMO as a fear of missing out. But for, yeah. for perfectionists, it's not fear of missing out. It's really fear of mistake overwhelm, mm. right? We're mm -hmm. so afraid we're going to make a mistake that we may not start something in the first place or we research something to death, you know, uh, just trying to cross all the T's and dot the I's. Yeah. And, um, we're, we're usually far more empathic and compassionate with other people than we are ourselves. Mm. And, um, and so even though, uh, and here's a stunning piece of research that procrastination is something that perfectionists really worry about. Um, the stunning discovery of this 10 year mega research is that perfectionists don't actually procrastinate any more frequently than the general population. However, we worry about it more. Mm. So we're very achievement oriented. And so we yeah. like to tick those boxes, you know, right. Um, right. but ticking those boxes doesn't give us a sense of lasting accomplishment. Mm. And so we tend to be driven by the sense of lasting accomplishment and you know, so boundaries are issues, um, a lot of overwhelm. Like I can't tell you, even myself, you know, I used to say, oh, I wish I'd rather have too much on my plate than not enough. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I look back at that now and go, <laughs> what about ease? What about, you know, <laughs> I, look, I remember going through law school and at the at the end of law school, I mean, when you just in the community of lawyers, the, there was this uh, workaholism thing that was it was not a it was a badge of honor. How many how many hours you dedicated to working in the firm or whatever? You know, I mean, that was people would go around and talk about that. And it was it got to a, a level of absurdity because, of course, many of those people were quite miserable. <laughs> yeah. Not so having a life. Burnout is a big problem with perfectionism because, you know, the billable hours, um, of course, that's a challenge. You, you've got to have a, you know, a reasonable amount of billable hours, but we tend, we tend to drive into, we tend to go into overdrive, right. Mm -hmm. And then get overwhelmed and then we get burnt out and then, and then we're kind of like, oh, well, let me just chill for a little while, but then we start on that um, hamster wheel all over again. So it's right. it's the cycle that keeps repeating, mm -hmm. and uh, it can it makes us um, uh, not want to take decisions quickly. So we're not as agile. We feel like we, you know, we need a lot of information, and we keep questioning and and. Uh, we often hear from other people, you, your standards are too high or your standards are really high. And we're and we think, no, our standards are great. Like you need to measure up. <laughs> now that's a good m metric. Cause one of the things when you're trying to diagnose, if you are, is this me is, is really helpful when you get those external cues too. There's the internal thing. But for me, a sign like that, it's like, do people say this to you? And you're like, yeah. And then is this how you feel? Uh, you know, yeah. And it's like, oh, you might be, <laughs> you might be suffering from perfectionism. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's yeah. funny because um, my husband's a computer engineer and uh, he used to develop software and then he would show me and um, he'd love for me to pick up a part because I was so critical, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was always looking for the problem. Right. So, so we tend to be. Now we don't think we're critical, right? We, we think that, in our pursuit of excellence or perfection, we think everybody should have this kind of standard, and. Uh, and here's a mindset shift. Okay. So, so bringing my husband back into this, he's like, well, I have high standards. Why don't you call me a perfectionist? And I said, so when you don't meet the standards that you expect of yourself, do you, um, do you beat yourself up over it? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, no, of course not. I'm just learning. <laughs> Why would I beat myself up? There you go. You're not a you're not suffering from perfectionism, right? There. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's like, yeah. <laughs> so really, what people should think about is what is the impact on me? You know, what? How am I responding to it? That's really where to look if you want to if you want to get real with yourself about whether or not you're suffering from it. Is what? It, what do I? What am I telling myself? Uh, and I love that changing standard. You know, it's like it's like this belief that perfection is actually it's like almost is this right? It's like an acknowledgement that. Yes, I know that I'm not perfect and that nothing is ever actually perfect. Therefore, I am always going to be less than perfect. Therefore, if I reach a certain standard, it must not be perfect. And so I'm stuck in a trap of never good enough. Right. And I would like to shift that paradigm to say you were born perfect. Mm. And you don't have to strive or earn or you are already deserving of right. being good enough right. you are, because you don't, you don't have to strive or earn it, you know? And so there's this, we think we have to get it right. Right. How, how would you, uh, there's a lot online right now. A lot of practitioners are focusing on what they call imposter syndrome um, or the sense that I'm, I'm faking it basically. How do you distinguish between if it's, an imposter syndrome situation and a perfectionism situation, or are those? That, that's really a great question because they do. There are researchers that put perfectionism under the umbrella of imposter syndrome, and the people that I know who work with imposter syndrome, it tends to be more of a temporary situation. Now we may feel imposter syndrome from time to time, especially as we expand our comfort zone, and so they tend to be more situational, but. Um, perfectionist, it's not like you, you, uh, you overcome being a perfectionist, mm. like you overcome imposter syndrome, uh, perf putting perfectionism in its place is really about accepting and practicing other things that really help you, um, a create awareness, B um, acknowledge, see, shift that mindset and, and utilize practices that are more beneficial for you. So imposter syndrome tends to be, well, I feel like a fraud or I, you know, like, I don't feel like I'm leading or, uh, cause I had imposter syndrome, um, that was driven by the perfection is mm. okay. So they, they are interrelated, but I would say that imposter syndrome tends to be more situational. And so it will come and go as we kind of expand. Mm, that's really, that's a really good distinction to keep in mind of, you know, we know we're not going to, you're not going to get rid of the perfectionist tendencies. You're going to learn to live with it and be health healthy with it. And also, you know, there's a strength that's, in, that's intertwined with that too, in that you have high standards and you want to do really well, but not get punished by the part of it that will eat you alive. Is that kind of accurate? Yeah. So, um, researchers differ on this and oh, okay. <laughs> how so? Yeah. Well, Enlighten some, us. Some, <laughs> some, some say that there's good perfectionism and, and bad perfectionism and, uh, others say, well, there is no good perfectionism. Um, what they call the good perfectionism is really just having high standards because the perfectionism by its definition really is um, when you don't meet those high standards that you 
are highly critical and you take a more of a fixed mindset than an opener mm -hmm. learning mindset. So uh, we believe that the perfectionism, these high standards, you know, yeah, they're fine. Don't, I'm not telling anybody, let go of your high standards. Okay. Cause I remember I was working with a client and she said, well, I'm kind of worried. Like I don't want to let go of my high standards. And I said, don't let go of your high standards. Let go of beating yourself up when you don't meet them or, <laughs> or, you know, the self, the other oriented, like, don't be so critical of your staff when they don't quite meet it, that like they feel eviscerated, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so there's this, um, there's a balance, but really when we let go of, of that critical part of it, we can keep those high standards, but having high standards in and of itself is not perfectionism. So if we're thinking about this, if I'm hearing you correctly, there's utility in sort of separating it out and using those words di for different purposes. So having high standards is good. Perfectionism is dangerous to you and others. And yeah, it can, it can be crippling. Unhealthy. It can be crippling. So it can that be toxic. Way we, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes a lot of mm -hmm. sense. Okay. So we know that it causes huge problems. We know that people suffer from it and a lot of people suffer from it. Um, we've, and we know it causes a lot of pain, uh, personally and in a group scenario as well. And there are, do you, by the way, before we go into the solutions for it, do you have any, any resources you can help point people to in terms of self-diagnosis or do they just need to hire you and have you help them? No, I actually out? have, uh, something that they can take. So, um, usually when I work with people, we, we look at um, how much of a perfectionist are you? So I have a reference point of 1,500 other perfectionists. And, um, and so it, it's a self-assessment. Uh, and, and we can walk people through that. And um, you can share the link with every, anyone who wants to take that. Okay. So, uh, so we'll, in the description, we'll put links to all the resources that we talk about in the podcast. And that would be a good one to get started with just to see if, you know, if you kind of already think you might be suffering from it, yeah, you might want to validate that. And, uh, and now let's move into the, there's hope. <laughs> there <laughs> so, is hope. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the hope, Liz. What, um, what are some ways that people can break free from, the well, I think the, it's the procrastinating that goes along with perfectionism, and also just start addressing this. Yeah. So, um, so let me let me do two things. One is uh, I'll talk about procrastination and um, and one thing that they can do. Uh, but I have seven steps, a seven a seven step system that I provide my clients, and it starts with the perfectionist mindset where we create awareness because awareness is really important of what's going on. And then we look at um, excellent goals, creating um, clarity and calming the inner critic. And uh, the third step is results. And this has to do with procrastination. Um, there are four main reasons why everybody procrastinates <laughs> and um and the first one of those is belief so for us as perfectionists the the belief very often is that we're afraid of failure we're afraid of making a mistake and so we don't start it or we put it off um and this is really I think the number one reason there, there are other reasons. Okay. So to, uh, address that, it's really aligning with, um, with focusing on what does success look like? And, and I have tools that I work with my clients on really aligning better with, 
removing and releasing some of those self-limiting beliefs that cause us to think, uh, you know, it's never going to be right. I'm, I shouldn't start it, all that kind of stuff. And like I said, we are pretty hard on ourselves on procrastination because we're so achievement oriented, but we actually don't procrastinate uh, any more than the general population. So anyway, I have, I have some tools on procrastination that uh, I work with. So that's the third step. And then the fourth step is really fighting forgiveness. And this is creating space for grace for ourselves. Uh, so we can reduce that self judgment and the, uh, one, two, three, four, yeah, where are we? Fifth, fifth, fifth one, yeah. <laughs> We're fifth on five, is, yeah. Yeah, empathy and self-compassion. Mm -hmm. uh, to be kinder to ourselves, this is about emotional resiliency. And uh, and then the, wait a minute, so perfect, perfectionist mindset, excellent result, excellent goals, results, finding forgiveness, empathy and self-compassion, connection with the full self. So this is about asserting boundaries uh, which we tend to like raise our hand. I mean, I used to do this all the time. We would raise our hand. Oh, I'll volunteer. I'll do that because it makes us feel valued. Mm. But then we get too much on our plate, right. you know? Right. And we're kind of the go-to get it done person, but at great cost to ourselves personally. Mm. Mm. Right. And so that that the last one is uh, take time to celebrate. And that's really about boosting our dopamine and celebrating progress along the way, because what happens as uh, perfectionists is we tend to say, OK, I'll celebrate when I'm done. But then here's what happens. We have this high standard. We don't think we met it. And so we have this not good enough gap and we don't want to celebrate because we don't think we deserve it because mm. we haven't hit our standard. Mm. So yeah. all of those together spell perfect. <laughs> my seven perfect steps. It's the perfect steps, perfection. really. <laughs> you know, it's the perfect path. There you go. That's the name of your next program, The Perfect yeah. Path. And yeah. um, I have more details in, uh, in a handout, in a link that you'll provide about per putting perfectionism in its place using these seven Great. steps. Now, yeah. Look, um, what does let's there are probably people who are like, yeah, 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 that's all great. But, you know, if you've relied on that self-perception of your perfectionism as a strength to bo to boost yourself in a sense, even though it's hurting you, um, let's talk about what the more benefits of what it's going to mean externally for those who are not convinced that the internal is enough. What about the people around them? How are they going to, what results are they going to see even beyond their own well-being and health in business, for example? So here's, I guess, uh, one of the best examples is one of my uh, clients who was like, this changed my life. Just the awareness alone. Um, my family said I was acting differently. My, uh, my direct reports said I was acting differently. And, and this individual is responsible. I mean, basically he said, look, the decisions I make impact 5,000 people in the organization. Mm. And, and he said, so if I delay on a decision because I'm trying to make it perfect, I'm not, um, I'm not responding to the market, to competitors. We're not getting our products or services out as quickly. I'm handicapping my staff because I'm not delegating as much as I would like to because I, I want everybody to get it perfect. And so I overwhelm myself. And he's like, this, the pressure has, has shifted. And they were able to respond more quickly to the market, uh, the, the impact on on the entire, you know, cascading of the organization, the piece that he's responsible for, um, it shifted. So his direct reports, uh, so the, his, his entire team or his part of the organization became more agile because he became more agile. Mm. 
Mm. Yeah, that makes perfect perfect sense. Um, now I'm gonna, every time I say the word perfect, I'm going to be going. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, it really does. I mean, agility, innovation. I think of psychological safety. Uh, it's hard to create a psychologically safe environment if people feel judged because you're judging yourself really harshly, but you're also judging others um, by that same standard. And um, and if you can have show yourself a little more grace and everyone else, they're gonna they're gonna feel like they can take a risk and create something new and, and uh, not include you in absolutely everything, which is going to tie you down. And I'm going to add one more thing uh, that really struck me because yeah. it isn't what we set out to do, but the, uh, the relationships with customers and clients mm. uh, improved. And so that also was uh, a really huge factor. So it's like mm-hmm. the benefit is a bottom line benefit. You know, there are tangible results to this. Right, right. All through it, just this leader shifting right. and his entire organization, it just cascaded down. Right. So it, I can I can imagine an executive who's like, something's wrong. I'm not quite sure then they might even get a coach that's going to approach it from a traditional executive coaching or leadership coaching standpoint. And they'll sit down and ask them what they want to do. And they'll, they'll miss the entire opportunity because they're not addressing sort of the elephant in the room, which is their perfectionism. And if they asked other people, they'd, they'd get a clear view. So it seems to me that really paying attention to the people around you, what they're saying um, or not saying, um, and giving, giving that the value it deserves might, get, might help you get sort of out of the, out of the delusional state that we, that we all get in about ourselves <laughs> and, and get out of it and then address the real issue. I don't know. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I wonder how many leaders you've come across that are suffering from it, but don't see it yet. Uh, You know, I've worked with quite a number of leaders that they didn't come to me initially uh, due to perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then I would hear them say certain things and I would say, "Has do you uh, consider yourself a perfectionist? And some of them don't, they don't kind of identify that way. But if I say things like, do you have, you know, exceptionally high standards that you're proud of and do you, um, are you hard on yourself when you don't meet them? And do you feel like you kind of need to control everything because people aren't going to get it done right? Mm. So you can't delegate. Um, and it's really frustrating for you because you would like to delegate more, but you're, uh, you just don't think your staff are going to get it done in the way that it needs to happen. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, that's, I thank you. That's kind of what I was alluding to. Was I'll bet that's a lot of the times the situation where you don't come in through the front door on it. You know, you kind of, oh, you know, and then eventually it's like, oh yeah, this is the real issue, um, the, or the opportunity for the most breakthrough, the most growth and relief. Frankly. Yeah. So, so yeah. the relief is tremendous because. Yeah. When you can put perfectionism in its place, but keep your standards as a perfectionist, you know, but, but the, uh, the pressure, the, uh, the crippling aspects of it, um, there's a sense of freedom really. And, and professionally, you know, it helps like I said, the bottom line, it helps with the team, it helps with um, the customers. And, and everybody's a little bit different, you know. Um, But there, there are certain hallmarks that when I when I bring the community of these leaders together, um, from time to time, when I have group programs, what I think is the most remarkable is, wait, you mean it's not just me? Right. I'm not alone. You have, yeah, I'm not alone. Right. You have the, like, you have the same issue or, or if I'm just working one-on-one, sometimes it's like, well, mm-hmm. Liz, you went through this and like, you were able to like, set that down and put it aside. Like, 
I want when I would be able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's it, perfectionism. It seems like it's it's this sort of um, we all have experienced either suffering from it or suffering directly from internally or suffering from it externally. I, I know I certainly have, um, and on both sides. Um, but and yet it's not. I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something, but it's not always the first thing that people are thinking about. There's all these other things, you know, the toxic leader, the this or that. But um, and yet it's it's quite prevalent. So you're doing you're in a zone that I think is much, much needed. And I think, um, you know, you're you're going to be helping even more people as time goes on, as, as the word gets out. Liz, you um, you've already shared that you have a great resource for helping under helping someone understand whether or not or see uncover their perfectionism and see that it's causing them a problem. And you've got these seven principles um, I think they were principles, right? Practices, practices of perfectionism, um, of perfectionists. You've got a lot of resources. I- any other resources that people should know about? And where do people go to connect with you and interact with you? Well, they can go to my website, inter- innergenuity.com, I N N E R G N U I T Y. Um, and uh, also, I'm on Twitter at Elizabeth Onyabo. And Instagram, I think it's the same. So um, all of those places you can connect with me and those are on my website. And um, and I have a newsletter that I put out weekly. So I give tips every week for leaders. So they would go to the website to register for the newsletter, I assume. Sure, yeah. And are, are you also on LinkedIn? Are you active on LinkedIn as yes, well? Yes, I'm very, yeah. I should have said LinkedIn first, right? I'm yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very active on LinkedIn and I post a lot of information there. So if they follow me on LinkedIn, um, they can do a search of, and uh, or you can create a link uh, on the page and okay. they can follow me and I give tips there as well. So in the description, we will put the website, uh, the LinkedIn connection link so you can find Liz there and um, and maybe even direct links to those resources that we mentioned before. So you can easily get wherever you're at. Um, if you're not ready to talk to Liz quite yet, but you want to get her newsletter, you'll be able to do that. You'll be able to self-diagnose to it to a point. And I do encourage people watching and, and or listening to this to reach out to Liz. I found you to be so, um, you're full of insights. Uh, you have extreme brilliance and wisdom and a gentle way of doing it so that there's no judgment. It's just, let's help each other. You know, I'm here to help. And I think at the end of the day, there's nothing better than that when you've got someone like yourself that that has such incredible knowledge and heart that you bring to the table. Um, you know, I just that's been my experience with with Liz uh, over multiple conversations now. So if you think you might be suffering from perfectionism or you know someone that you work for, that you live with, that is struggling with this, uh, don't hesitate at all to reach out to, to, to Elizabeth. She's she's your person. So. Thank well, you so there, much, Matt. Yeah, um, thank you. And I just, is there any final word you want to send out into the universe about this issue and the opportunities that come with You know, I'm just going to give one final tip. And that is uh, a lot of people talk about inner critic and, uh, you know, shutting it up and things like that. But really... Um, your inner critic can become your best friend because your inner critic is actually trying to protect you, even though it doesn't seem that all that harsh judgment. So um, there's one tip that I would like to leave with people, which is when you're hard on yourself, I would like you to ask yourself a question, which is what would a best friend say to you in this instance and can you reframe what's going on for you from that perspective to allow your inner critic to be of more value to you or your inner voice let me say to be of more value to you um, and just reframe it as what would a best friend say you just proved my previous point (laughs) 
<laughs> that is a wonderful, wonderful way of looking at it. Thank you for sharing uh, just just a little bit of, of what you bring to the table on this important topic. Liz, I'm really glad we got to spend this time together, and I know it's going to help a lot of people. Me too. Thanks so much, Pat. Thanks a lot. <laughs>